are Vineyard. Somos Viña. We are Vineyard. One of the things that was a, a big value right from the beginning is that everybody gets to play. Mm. And so there was this invitation to get in the game. It wasn't just the holy man from front, the woman of God mm. from front, but it was anyone got to get in the game and play and do this mm. stuff. What's the spirit calling you to do? What's, you know, this thing? And then given space to do it. So, you know, just in contrast, the story I told earlier, that one church, I'm just begging for an opportunity to serve in some way. Mm -hmm. And then... I go to the thing here, and the next week I'm serving homeless people, and I'm <laughs> I'm praying for the sick, and thrown in over my head in some ways. Yeah, but like a reliance on the spirit, and that stirred in I think people like me, and we were just stirred to like, okay, what could we like the the horizon was open. Welcome to season three of the We Are Vineyard podcast conversations to help us grow with Jesus and each other. 2024 marks the 50th anniversary of Vineyard Churches in the U.S. And to celebrate throughout the year, we'll be periodically sharing the stories of local Vineyard Churches throughout the country. In today's episode, Jay Pathak will be interviewing Brad Bailey and John Ummer about West Side Vineyard Church. West Side Vineyard Church was planted in 1974, 50 years ago, when Ken and Joni Gullickson began a fellowship in West Los Angeles. And through that, God birthed the Vineyard movement. Let's listen in. Brad, John, I'm excited to be able to talk to you a bit today. Thanks for making time to hang out. We got two troublemakers here that we're going to talk through some of our story in the vineyard. So thanks for being with us. Great to be here. Yeah. Great good. to be here. Good. And uh, tell me where both of you are. John, you first. Where, where are you right now? I am in Syracuse, New York. Okay. Um, yeah. Syracuse. It's. I bet it's pretty... Is, is it a balmy, like, negative seven? What is it? It's like 89, 90 degrees. Um, <laughs> do you mean in that little room you're in? Because <laughs> it does look, you do have just like a brick wall. It does look sl a little like a hostage video right now. I mean, well, well, in my mind, in my mind, it's sunny and warm. Okay. All right. Well, now let's talk to the guy. It probably is 90 degrees where he is, 80 degrees. Where, where are you, Brad? Here on the west side of L.A., uh, in the Santa Monica, Culver City area. So great. You know, somebody, somebody's somebody got to do it. Suffering for Jesus, one of the most beautiful places in the whole world. Incredible place. Like, I was just rough. out there, so I was telling you, yeah. Well, Are you talking about Syracuse or L.A.? <laughs> both, both, obviously. <laughs> I mean, they're really indistinguishable. They're so yeah. similar. I mean, if I just showed you a picture of both, you'd be like, this has got to be the same place. I mean, so indistinguishable. So so what we want to do is talk a little bit about what would be our really the founding church of our movement. We're on the 50th anniversary of the first church that became all the things that are the vineyard. It's this June, right? Brad, you're celebrating the, the 50th. Is that right? Yep. Oh, man. So fun. So. Just want to hear uh, some stories about how the church formed, but really also how you guys both entered into the life of this church, what you experienced, what made you be a part of this thing called the Vineyard. And, and you know, I just believe that when we look at some of the earlier seeds of what things become, we get to learn a lot about our own story. We, we have this experience all the time in our own families, don't we? Like where you hear something about your family from three generations ago and you're like, wow, that's still true of like me, of us. There's this thing that's sort of rooted into us that's made us who we are. And so um, I'm really hopeful that in hearing some of these stories, we'll get a chance to learn a little bit more about our heritage. And, and in a rootless culture, a rootless world where we all live in a glowing rectangle that we carry in our pockets that give us access to everything it's nice to know no we 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 have stories of places and people and folks that made sacrifices for us so i'm excited to do some of that today so brad first just start with like you a bit i'd love to hear it. i've done a long podcast with john 
where we got to hear all of his story. If you've never heard that podcast, you should listen to John Elmer's story. It is beyond fun. I feel like we barely told stories. We mostly just laughed and made fun of each other. So it's a it's an hour of just like talking to two dudes like they were watching a football game together. But 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 we did also get some great bits of John's story. So we've heard a lot of his story, but I'd love to hear about you, Brad, a bit just to kind of set up how you enter into the story. Talk talk a little bit about where you were born and where you grew up. Uh, well, I'm born and raised on the west side here where this first vineyard is at. Mm. Didn't grow up in a family that was going to a church until about entering middle school time. Mm. Finally went to a church and heard of Jesus. And it had a profound impact because I think it was new to me. And something about if there's a God, this is what God would do. Mm. really grabbed something in my youthful soul. And it was like, I think this is true. And so it was a strange time of falling in love with Jesus, if I was to use that phrase now. Yeah. And being very rebellious by nature. So I was kicked out of school and did a lot of rebellious things, had a bit of that nature in me, even while I'm also really drawn to Jesus because I think I saw in him kind of the the rebel that uh, mm. that I could relate to, and something about the world not being right. And looking back, I I kind of see it as akin to that. I think God really wants to redeem rebels, and by mm. that I mean that little bit of everyone that says something's not right in this world. Mm. Because I think if we love the world as it is, and you know, kind of want the status quo, yeah. not going to be as drawn. So I think there was a part of me that was. Could, that's it helps explain that uh, kind of split part. But by the end of high school, going to college is when God really finished that fight that I was having mm. and really took hold of me in a really dramatic way. Came back from Hawaii where I was going to go and run off and live and surf and ended up going to San Diego State. And that's where things kind of finished off and uh, got involved with some uh, what would be Calvary chapels at that time. Mm. And so, you know, just my feel for worship and style, you know, of church became that. Mm. And then I would visit this vineyard church up here uh, when I was back up in LA at just a time or two. And Really? So wait, wait. So how old are you when that's happening? When you're starting to visit that first vineyard church? 20, 21. And I, I mean, at, at the risk of embarrassing you, what, what, what year is that? Where, what, where are we at in the? 80 to 82. Okay. So, so 1980, 82, you're this, I mean, did, I mean, give me the whole image. You've got long hair, you're a surfer, you're, you know, it's sort of bleached by the sun. I mean, is that, are you like the classic <laughs> California kid uh, or are you? It, or are you? It was a, <laughs> It was dark, but uh, okay, okay, everybody okay. had long hair. We all did. Didn't matter what <laughs> style hair you had, you put, tucked it behind your ear, even if it was a mop, because that's just what it was. That's just what and, it is. Uh, yeah. And uh, it works better for some of us. But the uh, <laughs> I would pop into this church because now I'm kind of used to that style of worship. A couple friends would be were attending this church. Yeah. That's all I really knew about it. Hmm. And then uh, at the end of college, I was invited and called to go and help with a church plant in Europe. So I hmm. go off for a couple of years abroad. And uh, while I'm there, I take a young adult group up to Zermatt, uh, where the Matterhorn is, hmm. for a ski time. It was like Palm Sunday. And I see a little card. I go for a run in the morning and I see a little card that says English speaking, you know, Palm Sunday. So I I, uh, I thought, oh, well, I'll see if I run into that. Go for a run at the top of the mountain. There's a little church, and there it is. So I walk in, and there's nobody there. <laughs> nobody. Just uh, whatever priest they had to to run the services. That turned out to be Sandy Miller of Holy Trinity Brompton. Of HTB. Who was, wow. Yes. Who was doing a vacation swap. <laughs> so he would get to go there and uh, cover some... <laughs> So he says, let's sit down. So we did, and we prayed. And he's telling me about John Wimber and the vineyard. And I said, you know, we've been exploring, learning more about the vineyard and John Wimber. And he says, well, we're having a conference in England, and I come stay at a place. So actually, it was while I'm in Europe that I actually learned about 
really what the vineyard movement was about. Wow. And that conference blew my mind, was disorienting uh, in, in good ways. And off to India I go, because I was actually on my way to go move to India. So what I knew during that time is when I come back to Los Angeles, I, I knew that I would shift and become a part of that church because I was headed back to go to seminary at some point. Yeah. So in 85, I did that. Come back and land in LA. And, and uh, but he, I'll tell you this one unique story is that I'm thinking, you know, I don't know anything about this church. It's going to be a big shift, you know, to, right. to start attending a new church. But that's, it's, I need to be a part of something that really fits. So I, I'm, that'll be a relationally strange. Been gone for two years. I'm landing back in LA. My parents pick me up, take me back to the home. And there's a vineyard Bible study by, Jim Kermath, who was the current pastor, taking place at their home. In their home? My parents, in their home. My parents took in wow. people all the time. They had taken in somebody who was connected to the vineyard, and Jim was over doing a Bible study. So we're literally meeting as I'm coming in the door. Who would have known? But that's my parents. Uh, just very open home. That's so cool. So, so begin to connect, and this kind of connects over to where uh, John and I have a number of things we're so, you know, different in ways. But I was thinking, John, we're both, we both were coming off the mission field in a way and landing into the West Side Vineyard. John in a far more radical way than anything I was doing. I was blown away by them. And he was married at the time and, and coming in. And then uh, we've ended up both in our home areas. Is that right, John? I mean, yeah. Yeah. So John, yeah, you know, I like we, that. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's you know, take that intersection point. We've done that. I was just going to say, really, we both ended up really loyal to the vineyard and we both have gone through succession seasons or in them. So there's yeah. a lot of parallels there, but that beginning, John and I both ended up on that, you know, staff at the time, which is the second iter like iteration. Cause at sure. this point, Ken had moved on. Yeah. And so we're yep. coming Ken in. Ken had moved stage. on. So so you you come in because you'd had this early experience. You have all the Sandy Miller HTB kind of weird conference. Then you're in India. Then you come back and it, then you didn't have to find the vineyard. The vineyard found you in that the Bible studies in your parents' home. And so now you start milling around. And it's in this similar time that an ex wrestler who had been spending time in Bangkok. Uh, amongst the poorest of the poor. Again, if you've not heard John's story, you really do want to listen to that whole podcast. You suddenly appear in West LA again. So isn't that, isn't that, or did you, no, you got sent to Bangkok from there, didn't you? I can't I remember. Did, give give yes. me the order. I'm sorry. I yeah. flipped, I flipped it. Yeah. I got ahead of it. So I actually came to the vineyard and was there as a, just a part of the church volunteer That's right. for a number of years. And they sent me. That's to, right. Bangkok, and then I came back and went on staff. But that's right. How, that's right. How I how I found out about Vineyard is really classic, and it says a lot about a core value of the Vineyard. So I was Gwen and I, my wife, we moved out to LA to get trained as missionaries to get a master's degree. And while out there, we just asked some people at the school, like, "What's a good church?" And they sent us this church in Pasadena near the school I was going to, and I went to the guy, it was a kind of upper income type church, kind of a classier church. And I, you know, I wasn't that classy at that point. And mm. you can hear the other podcasts to hear all that story. But after being there six months, I'd gone to the pastor and said, hey, I'd like to lead a Bible study sometime. I know I'm new, so just let me know when you think I'm ready. Uh, you know me enough. And after six months, he came up to me and just at the church said, I got to talk to you. And I... So I'm thinking this is my chance to do a Bible study or something, you know, in the church and leadership. And he says, hey, uh, you don't fit here. You need to go. And he kind of flicks his hand. Gestures with his hand. That's brutal. <laughs> Gestures, just go. And and I was shocked. And I'm like, what? And he says, uh, you don't fit here. You should go. Like, I, we were didn't have hardly any money. I was in a battle against materialism. I was semi-looking homeless. We didn't have a car, all those things. <laughs> He says, you don't fit her, you need to go. And I was just so shocked. I asked this guy, well, where should I go? Wow. And he says, oh, you should go to the vineyard. They'll take anybody. And that was the reputation of the vineyard. That I they'll love it. Take anybody. And I went there 
And it was so true. Like, yeah, it turns value. out that was an accurate assessment. <laughs> right? Hey, they even made me leadership. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> That's so great. But that was such a deep value. And there's such a variety of people, you know, from homeless to to high income people and, mm. you know, people in the movie industry. And it was just such a mix mm. that it was come as you are and be loved. It really was. In those so great. Days. And I see that in so many churches, so, so many vineyards. So, so both you guys, let, let me start with you, Brad. I mean, what is it you experienced just either in the ethos of what the church was? Because you said Ken and Joni have moved on, so they're not even leading. But there's certain elements, there's things that have been built into the sort of DNA, the way the church was. What is it that you experienced that you were like, yeah, this is my church? Like – man, this is what I've been looking for. What were the things that you saw or felt or became well, a part of? Well, I think I identify with that line that many people have said that I didn't so much join the vineyard, I realized I was, something of that. Mm -hmm. I think for me, I realized this is actually kind of where I've been landing in terms of my just seeing who Jesus was and what mm -hmm. have you. I think... Looking back on my experience, I would say those, particularly in those early days when Ken is, you know, launching, coming up into L.A. and starting something sent kind of from Calvary Chapel, but, it, you know, it, it takes quickly the name Vineyard and what he uniquely did. What I, By the time I came in, I think people have said, you know, we're the radical middle. So we've got evangelicals who are, I would say, kind of dry Mm -hmm. And so this idea that you could really value, you know, the Bible, but you're not asking what did God do, but also what is God doing, mm -hmm. is the part that I really identify with. And actually, after probably the first decade of being a part of the vineyard, I, I think that was the larger element that I saw and mm -hmm. the people I was meeting, as opposed to, let's say, the Pentecostal side coming in, which is also there. But I think I saw the vineyard looking back is having drawn a lot of dry evangelicals who mm. it's like, you know, we've been, it's all been about just learning of the book and learning about what God did. And the more you've learned about what God did, that was almost like the end in itself. And I think just the profound sense that, no, it's all about Jesus calling people to come and follow him and do, you know, is a much more challenging and beautiful and yeah messy and it was like i was embracing the mess like i mm. get it this is subjective it's more it's more challenging to really discern what god's doing and to believe the spirit of god is speaking and doing mm -hmm. but it's it's a mess i'll join and i trust this person by that point it was more you know wimber who's now leading it but as a leader i i really trust the discernment and the mm. the openness and i remember john at times saying things like you know hey i was wrong and I'm like, I don't, I hadn't heard a leader say they were wrong <laughs> in so long that I yeah. just, there was something about that. And uh, that all was very uh, alluring to me and just that God was really moving in the present. And mm. as John said, well, the the diversity of lives there, I think for me, I, I always wanted to be a part of a church that could reach people like me, mm. like we all do. I think that's partly what gets us in there is, if a, if a church has somehow created a space for us, as John was describing, we would want to be a part of something that could do that because that's what we're hoping to yeah. somehow continue on is is to be a part of something that reaches people most like us. And mm. so. So when you say doing messy things, seeing the messy work of ministry, what were some things that you found yourself doing that you weren't doing before? Like. Now I've got to like actually try some things I've not tried or be in some environments I'm not used to or kind of push through an awkward whatever. What, well, were, what were some of those kinds of things? Yeah, I think praying for people and praying for people to be healed as opposed yeah, to – that's, you know, that's a big one. Healing. That's pretty and, you know, weird. All, yeah. the, all those core elements, hearing from God, that God would really speak. Of course – you know, evangelicals would say they believe that, but it could get uncomfortable as to mm -hmm. what that meant and all mm -hmm. those types of things, really, that we're doing the stuff. I think it was also the era by which the vineyard was 
pressing out into the prophetic. And so mm-hmm. we, you know, go through years of that. And there were more elements than that. Mm-hmm. And the way I see it, I think John would venture out into something if he felt, well, there could be something to this. I need to be open to it. Right. And then he would kind of bring that pastoral discerning wisdom to bear to make sure that the church stayed the church and didn't kind of lose its way in it. And I think I appreciated that and I needed to trust that because I didn't necessarily care for all the certain elements that came from all those sources, but I felt like I'd, I think I'd rather be a part of the mess that can sort itself out than to be safe. Because yes. I contend as a person to be safe. Mm. And I think I kind of made a decision that, no, I I don't want to just, you know, just be safe. Yeah. And what I what I appreciate about what you're saying, which is what I experience in the vineyard now, or I remember my first time being in a vineyard, you know, in Columbus, Ohio. And, you know, part of the training loop is you go into this healing class and, you know, you're there and they're talking through the kingdom now, not yet. And here's some models of like what we think healing is and what it isn't. And this is where Pentecostals might talk about healing in a certain way. And and evangelicals would tendly say that there's healing, but it's mostly guide the surgeon's hand. And so it's all very, it's a very helpful. I'm like, oh, wow. Okay. I'm seeing the frameworks. I'm getting the grid. I can remember vividly. I mean, I, right now, like in my body, I can remember the moment they were like, all right, so now we're going to do it. And I remember being like, what? Wait, whoa, 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 whoa. I came to go to a class. I, I, I did not, <laughs> I did not sign up for whatever this, I, wait, 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 wait. I mean, I just remember this genuine sense of fear, like the wait a second. And just seamlessly transition into, okay, so we've been praying and here's some things we think maybe God would have us pray for. I mean, there was no voting in moment. Like there, you know, there wasn't like a pause where, hey, those of you that this was enough, you can leave Uh, because, because I would have taken it. I mean, if there had been enough of a gap, (laughs) that it'd been like, some of you just came for a class. Thanks for being here. And th- those of you that would like to practice, we're going to, you know, it was like, no, that's part of, this is, this is all training. This is training. Training is trying the things. And I mean, just, I remember just feeling like I was coming out of my body. Like, I'm really doing this. I'm going to put my hand on, uh, you know, as a person like whatever, two over, raise their hand based on some, okay, those of you around them. Go over. We just did, and and it's like all the training just went out of my head. Like all of a sudden, I'm like, wait a minute. There's five steps, I think, and but they were slow. Like, okay, so we said we're gonna do this. Step one is the interview, and I'm like, oh, that's right, that's right, interview. Okay, and you know, um, and I just I remember thinking it was the most terrifying thing ever. I, I I've never skydived, but I've heard. It's the same kind of feeling like you go do these little classes, you jump off a box and you're going to roll and, you know, you do this with your hands, you do this with your, you know, and everyone I've ever known with skydive said the reason you have to tandem jump is because the second you go to jump out, it's like everything just goes out of your mind. You don't remember anything you that you learned down on the ground. So you have to have somebody hooked to you. It's like as long as you don't knock them unconscious. And, and you're flailing. They will do everything. They they know what they're doing. That's exactly what I felt. I just stood there watching other people pray. And by the end, I went, oh, well, I can do I think I can do that. And the next time was, a, you know, 75% is terrifying. And then half is terrifying. And then 25. And then one of those, somebody actually got healed. And I'm like, whoa. Wait a minute. This is real. It turns out this is also real. This isn't just like we're trying stuff. And then before you know it, I'm the guy that some terrified person, you know, it's my job now to do that, to, to, to now train them. Now I'm now they're jumping with me. I'm going to make sure that they get through this experience without dying. I mean, it is electrifying to walk through that process. And to think how many folks have deep, meaningful lives with Jesus, but that thing just has never happened. 
they've never actually done the stuff the way we talk about. So I, I agree with you, Brad. That that one little move, I mean, whether it's hearing the voice of God, praying for the sick. I mean, the first time you see something demonic, it's like everything in your body goes, uh-oh, we've crossed a line that I don't know how to get back from now. Like I've seen, I've seen too much. I'm not able to see the world the same way. But that's because you're in the doing. That's not happening in some back room for the experts. We're all doing this, which is messy. I mean, you know, because like if we all trained everyone in surgery and said, okay, now we're all going to start operating on each other, <laughs> like that would be terrifying. This isn't quite that dramatic, but, you know, you get into some weird stuff if you're going to like hear from God, pray for each other. It's random dude next to me. You know, it's very vulnerable. So, I, yeah, I, I, I resonate with that. And I still see that true to be us today. The seeds of our family in that sense are bearing fruit all over the world. So, John, how about you? Was it similar stuff or different for you? Yeah, the my first interaction when I came in, it was for the first time, it seemed like to me, I got a taste of the full kingdom. Mm -hmm. Like I remember we were, we were meeting in uh, – an old beat up uh, Mexican movie theater, and it was packed. <laughs> I love this. And I went in, and they ushered us up to the top because that was the only place where there's seats. And worship started. And it was incredible, like the 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 quality, but also that sense of intimacy mm. and the presence of the spirit that I'd never experienced before. It wasn't just singing songs; it was something different. Mm. That I was even just a spectator, but it was like over. Overwhelming, like wonderful. And then Jim got up, Jim Kermit, the pastor, got up to preach, and it was a depth of the word. Like he was an incredible preacher. Mm. And it wasn't just like we're going to learn about the history. It's like this is a living word that speaks to you today. And I don't mm. remember what the message was, but it hit deep. And there was there was a power in the presence of the Holy Spirit. And suddenly mm. they're doing real ministry to like, okay, if you have this, come up, we're going to pray for like. Like you were kind of saying, like, this isn't just theory. This isn't stories yeah. from before. This is this is now. And then I remember, too, like in the announcements, it was about, oh, we're doing this with the homeless today. We're doing this with the poor. And it was like kingdom work with the poor. It was, it was like the whole enchilada. Like for the first time yeah. I was experiencing church and it was, it was like, hey, we get to do the things that Jesus does in all those ways. And the spirit is alive. And it was like. It blew me away. I mean, Gwen yeah. and I walked out. And we're like, like, what, what was that? that? Yeah, totally. that, yeah. I, uh, they they don't have that in Syracuse. That wasn't in Kansas. <laughs> I don't know where I am, but that was wonderful. It oh, was, I love it. It was this flow of the spirit and this openness, and it was messy, like Brad, like you're saying, man. It was, mm -hmm. but it was great. we celebrate our 50-year anniversary in the Vineyard. If you're interested in learning more about Vineyard history, there are plenty of resources for you. Check out our show notes for links to books, YouTube videos, and more to learn about Vineyard history and identity. And make sure to keep listening to the podcast this year for stories of Vineyard churches throughout the year. So many people would have your story, John, of Something about the worship, something about the worship, like drew me in. There was an authenticity. There was a sense that the people leading expected God to be there, to move, to speak. That was their expectation. God's going to do something today. And we're worshiping not a God that's like, you know, somewhere on the other side of outer space, that if we sing enough, maybe our songs will get to him. You know, like he'll, he, it, somehow he's here yeah. and he's moving yeah. among us. And when we sing, we become aware of his presence. That, I mean, the amount of folks that the key story for them is, I found myself crying and I didn't know why. I didn't know what was happening. Yeah, I and, summarized that 
experience that people still do have so often. And yes, I think it is the difference if we come to sing songs about God versus man, we're coming to meet God and you know, be in his presence and all of that. And I think I think people in different ways are explaining like there's something here that is greater than the sum of the parts. In yeah. other words, I see this amount of people singing. That's wonderful. There's a certain dynamic that comes with that. But there's something more here now. You know, it's God inhabiting the praises of his people. And yes. it's that sense that there's more here yep. that is striking to people. Like, I think God's here. Well, and the amount of folks that even, I mean, it sounds like it was different for you guys. When I hear the stories of, you know, the church that, you know, you had this incredible amount of talented musicians, really gifted. I mean, you're in West LA. I mean, it's cheating. But the amount of times that I hear people say, and actually, just from a natural point of view, the music wasn't that good. Like, it was okay. Like, it was simple. It was solid. They stayed in time. But something else was happening. You know, that I, I was in another place where the music was great, but that same thing wasn't there. Um, yeah. that, 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 that kind of thing, that intangible describes a value that, you know, we're waiting on, we're responding to, we're expectant that the spirit is leading, that worship leaders are trained to pay attention to what's happening, like actively, you know, in our movement, you know, you pay attention. Oh, okay. Let's linger here a little bit longer or yeah, if we have to cut that song out, we just cut it out. You know, let's just stay in this song for a while. I remember the first time we went to a vineyard, I was like, you know, because when I went to Columbus, it was pretty big, you know, but they still kept these values, even though I think when I went, it was five services because they couldn't fit everybody. And I remember one set, it was, I was like a song and a half because they just kept looping around, staying in the song. And I remember saying to uh, Danielle, who's now my wife, she's my girlfriend then, like, I think we sang one song today. Like, when I like, like what? what? But it, it was great. It was so great. But I don't know how that happened. And, and she's like, I bet they didn't plan that. You know, they just were like, we're staying here. There's something here. And, you know, the little prayers in between, like, some of you, this is what the Lord's doing. Like, just pay attention to this. Allow the Lord to speak to you. And that sense that it's it's actually leading in responding to the spirit. Yeah, that would be in the ministry of the poor. Somehow it's all mixed together. I, I, I loved your little phrase, the whole enchilada. I wonder where that comes from. Was there ever a part I enchilada? <laughs> what I was saying is I said, I hope this isn't offensive. It's just coming out right now. But I a, love half, a quarter enchilada. It's like it's like most of the enchilada, but not the whole enchilada. Anyway, I'm just curious. I I think I've said it, I've heard it. I just it just I just it occurred to me like, I wonder what that is. Anyway, but I mean maybe it's the one right now. <laughs> the whole one or just half? Just oh. a part, just a part of an enchilada. Okay, so so those how do you guys make sense of the expansion of this thing? So there's lots of ways the churches do incredible things, but they don't reproduce. So we can think through churches through history that were dynamic and interesting, but they didn't reproduce. They didn't build more churches. They didn't scale. What's so amazing about the things you're describing is – it feels to me when you guys are talking like you're describing most vineyard churches I walk in today anywhere in the world. So like something God was doing 50 years ago and continuing was the kind of thing that people were able to kind of move with and take to other places. First of all, of course, in Southern California, but I'm sitting in Denver John's in Syracuse. There's churches all over, as you know, Brad, in India and Africa and Europe and Southeast Asia. That the if they heard us talking right now, they would be like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what that's that's what's in our heart. That's what we do. That's what the vineyard is. How do you explain that? What what in the world was happening? 
What What do you think, John? I, you know, I think one of the things that was a, a big value right from the beginning is that everybody gets to play. Hmm. And so there was this invitation to get in the game. It wasn't just the holy man from a front, the woman of God hmm. from a front, but it was it was anyone got got to get in the game and play and do this hmm. stuff. And we're all we're encouraged to what's the spirit calling you to do? What's you know this thing? And then given space to do it. So you know it, you know just in contrast, a story I told earlier that one church. I'm just begging for an opportunity to serve in some way. Mm -hmm. And then I go to the vineyard and the next week I'm serving homeless people <laughs> and I'm, I'm praying for the sick and, and, you know, I, thrown in over my head in some ways, yeah. but like a reliance on the spirit and that, that stirred in, I think people like me and probably same thing with you, brother. Like we were just stirred to like, okay, what could we like the, the horizon was open and God had elbow room to move and to call us. And hmm. the Holy Spirit called people all over to do all yeah. kinds yeah. of things. Yeah. And that's one of the things the vineyard has always probably had more impact than our size mandated. Like hmm. we're outsized of, of the kind of impact we had yeah. through our communities and through, through Christianum too. Hmm. That's interesting. What do you think, Brad? Because it is a phenomenon. It's pretty wild to think yeah. 50 years later. Yeah, the I, think what, I think what John is, is describing is so true. It's, it was a, a real uh, shift. And I think you had kind of a, a shift from the idea of professional ministry to vocational calling kind of that mm. was probably really needed. I think that this was an era where if what you really chose was to go to seminary, it was just one in the same. And if you get that degree, then you hope that maybe your denomination or whatever you're attached to might let you do something. It was very along those lines. And mm. the vineyard has never been anti-education, which is really good, but it was, what do you do? And I, I think that was very healthy for me to come into and hear like, your, your degree in seminary isn't going to be what's, you know, what's essential it's yeah. really let, let's start doing so i mean as soon as i came in uh started attending the church it was like all right you know it's great to have you here uh join the uh home church kinship group you know training and uh and lead a kinship group you know in other words you need to lead it doesn't matter what you know you need to lead and yeah. uh let's see what what god does with that and i think the other thing that was significant is that you had a whole generation at that point that is different than you had a Jesus movement. So you had a lot of lives that were drawn to, you know, be a part of something. And mm. I think the idea of I can do that, you know, made a big difference. I think opening the doors to that idea that people wanted to see something like that happening meant that you had people really in most cities too that were waiting to do something new now that new thing was eventually not so new but at that mm -hmm. time you know that that was enormous and uh i think you had a, a generation who was looking at jesus and seeing him as kind of the revolutionary which the church had generally made him really much more of kind of conservative and safe and conventional. Yeah. And so when you made Christianity very a very for people who want a conventional moral life to this shift to Jesus is a radical revolutionary, you really unleash something there too. Yeah. So I think there was something bigger than the vineyard going on too. Yeah. That was really something not to forget and let go of because I think the world's still looking for a revolutionary and not looking for a new religion. And I think that's an important thing to keep in mind. That's good. Yeah. And I, I, I think your observation that there are some, I mean, if we were going to be less spiritual, sociological trends, there's some ways that folks are trying to do something radical with their life coming out of the 60s, into the 70s. You know, there's a sense of like, come on, we got to do something here. There's a sacrificial, courageous nature to how you live that's sort of sweeping across the country. 
And then the, there was the kingdom move there, you know, Jesus revolution stuff happening. But what I find interesting when you say that, because I know people are all present to that, what I find interesting is how many Christian or denominational structures didn't experience that. So just because something sociological or even kingdom is happening doesn't mean that because you're a follower of Jesus, you're necessarily going to be swept into it. You know, um, there was something to your point, John, of, no, we're mobilizing people. People are going to get in the game. They're going to do things. We're going to try stuff that gave the expectation for younger leaders that like, man, I could do this. And what if I just tried? And what if something happened? Then what? Then I maybe I do the next thing and then I could do the next thing. And the thought that God might speak to me and people might band together and show up in places they've never been and <laughs> try stuff with almost no money and no real clear sense of like how to do it. But I'm going to take the things I know how to do. I'm going to try it over here. And then if some stuff happens, I guess we'll do the next thing. And if it doesn't happen, at least not to where it's a church or whatever. So what? Uh, whatever. You know, we tried a thing. And so I think what's a, what's a sort of hidden story of the vineyard, it's not that hidden. I mean, Todd Hunter, actually, when he was a national director, had a whole survey and a study done on how much failure is in the vineyard. So a hidden story of the vineyard is a lot of things we tried didn't work, like a lot. <laughs> the vast majority, frankly, are like, oops, we thought we were planning a church and we uh, it turns out we just did some stuff for a while and people came home. Was was a way higher number than I think many people realize. But again, there was something in that that was like, well, whatever. We got to try the thing. We Let's see what we can get. Let's see what we can do. And John, I know from your story, failure wasn't necessarily the end. So, okay, that didn't work. But I wonder what would work. Now what do we do? So, okay, I tried that thing. That didn't go that well. Let me try this thing. Eh, that didn't go that well. <laughs> let me try this thing. Oh, that's going a little bit better. You know, let's let's keep the impetus was always sort of rolling forward. Uh, that's what I see specifically that early stage, because John, then out of all that, you get sent to Bangkok. You know, you come home, you know, sort of beat up and tired and wondering, like, what have we done? For a lot of people, that's the end. And it's like, oh, well, I didn't do what we thought it was going to do. I guess now we, you know, I go sell cars or whatever. Um, but you're like, nah, I'm sure there's something else I can do. Talk a little bit about that rolling forward feel. Because, I mean, even like Ken, Ken plants his church. He's like, okay, we'll go plant another church. I guess this guy's doing it. Oh, that, some weird stuff happened there. All right, Brad, you're in, man. You know, like, like the, the amount of just kind of like people just moving around, trying things is pretty stunning when you look at the early history of the vineyard. Say a little bit about that for you, John, like your experience of just trying stuff, flexing, moving. Yeah, I, I do think, as Brad mentioned earlier, the fact that John Wimber would say, yeah, that was wrong. Let's try something new. <laughs> Let's shift. And, you know, and a leader of his thing, it was a big shift for all the people behind him, too. Right. Um, it was it was part of our genetic code to have. To honestly say, yeah, we're missing the basket, and then we we need to fix our shot, or we need to do something yeah. different, or yep. And so that that uh, that that willingness to say this isn't working. Well, how am I going to still stay in the game? Because that was so such a deep value. Mm -hmm. Well, let's maybe there's another place I could play. There's a different way I could play. I have these gifts. How can we use them? And I think not only the people thinking about for themselves. I think some of the great leaders in the vineyard have always thought about that for people they were were leading. Yeah. Like, what's your gifts and how's the best way? You're not, you know, any any 20-year-olds 
right now listening to this is probably messing up or just messed up or is about to mess up, you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and actually dirty little secret, probably any 60 year old too, yeah. you know? Yeah. And so it's not like, oh, well now you're disqualified completely. You're gone. Right. You have a, a black mark and we can't do anything with you anymore. Yeah. It's like, how do we get through that? How do mm. we, how do we grow from that? And how now can we, what is God calling you to do right now with this so good. learning? Yeah. Well, and how as a leader, is it my job to help facilitate that? That's part of my job yeah. is to look at you and say, okay, this didn't go the way we thought it was going to go, but we learned some things. Wonder what we're going to do next. Let's try something else and it'll be all right. I'll tell you, we'll I, figure it out. I messed up bad a lot, number of times as when I was a pastor at the vineyard and, and Jim, Kermath, who's a pastor, had that like, okay, what can we learn from that? Yeah. And how do we grow from that? And what a gift. that taught me something that I hope that's what I did for the next 30 years in Syracuse was, yeah. you know, as best I could, I tried to do that. Like, okay, what can we learn here? How do we get this person um, healthy and healed and moving in what God's really called them to be? So good. Well, I've taken a lot of your time, guys, but I want to ask Brad, I want to ask you one question and try and land our plane a little bit. So this... June, you'll be at 50th anniversary of the church. You're in a succession plan now. There's all kinds of things going on. Talk a little bit about from those days to these days. What are the bits that you feel like, man, those have stayed with us. We got to hold on to these things. This is what I know it is to be the vineyard. I have confidence, no matter how many things change, because things are always changing. You know, these are the things that I believe God still has invested in us that if if the Lord, you know, it, it, if it's hundreds of years before he returns, these are the things that would be to be a vineyard that I have faith for as I'm handing the baton from those days to the days I've had to what I'm praying for moving forward. Well, I think one thing that's maybe a little distinct to Southern California and particularly maybe, you know, where we are on the West side is that you have, you know, you have Ken planting this church so long ago and yeah. the uniqueness that he brings to bear on it, which was even different than in ways than uh, John Wimber and, and some of the mm -hmm. others. But there was such a, you know, a draw of lives and, and what have you. There was worship. There was kind of a waiting on the spirit. So many of those things were quickly, way back from the very start. Nothing had come up from Orange County to L.A. until really mm -hmm. Kent planted that. By the time Ken left, which it did quickly, there was a lot of churches filling into the West Side coming in, and there has been ever since, mm -hmm. who share many of those things. Yeah. So suddenly you have the striking thing here is you have a movement that was largely, you know, there was a catalytic element because it was new. Yeah, And now there's nothing particularly new, you know, to that. Right. And there was lots of charismatic personalities and, you know, leading the, those moments. So you have a whole shift there that you're not as novel or new. Right. So I think part of it is really having to embrace, but what is it about us? You yeah. know, and I think part of that for me is I think, as John said, that you, you I think that vineyards have remained, at least for us, a church that everybody's really welcome to mm. and it's a lot messier than a lot of the other you know mm. dynamics and that's a value that we hold a lot of people will mm. say yep you put out there on the sign come as you are and yep that's how i'm coming <laughs> and and then you know we're working with that that's that's a distinction i hope that we bear mm. i but i also think where we are uh jay it it was three percent churched so I'm coming back from Europe because that's the mission field. It's totally unchurched. It's post-Christian. Yeah. And realizing that's all I've ever known here. Mm. Probably less than 3%. Yeah. So I think for me, rising above the sense of uh, vanity and competing with other churches, there's always an element. You feel that. But the ability to rise above and realize there's 97% who aren't even engaged. And at this point in culture secularizing secularizing quickly aren't even really interested 
Yeah. To me, that's enough. That's very compelling. So let's keep being what we are. Yeah. Let's do our part, as John used to say so well. We're one slice of the pie, but let's let's of the pizza, but let's do it well. And and I think and embracing what is distinctly us and taking our part is so needed in any city. It's it's yeah. certainly one that remains so so important uh here. And uh, mm. and so I to me that's that's something I think uh, every pastor has to kind of find. It's like I'm not really competing with us. It may feel like it because I also need to build and what have right. you. But really, where can I find, as you've done so well leading us, where can I see myself partnering with others yeah. and see that we need to raise the spiritual water level, if you will, of the city? Yep. Not not merely just you know try to make this successful in yep. some kind of. Uh, individual way because it's so much bigger what's going on yeah and and it's so much more compelling there isn't a day that we're not needed there isn't a day that we don't have you know lots of people to try to connect with so amen um, amen oh that's so good man well big celebration in june for the 50th for you guys and of course at our national conference we'll be highlighting some of those elements you know i as I told you before we recorded, I got to record a bit with Ken and Joni Gullickson, a bit about some of the story of the vineyard. I'm excited to be able to share that with the whole movement this summer at our national conferences. So if you can make it to one of those, you should do that, east and west. But And then I don't know how big your party, how big a party you want for your 50th, but if you're in Southern California or around the country, can people just show up to your, to your big party, your 50th? <laughs> well, we don't. <laughs> we don't have that much room. We're not, you know, one thing we're doing, we're not really making this a reunion. Uh, no, but it can be a celebration. Yeah. Yes. And we want to really honor uh, yes. Ken and Joni because we Amen. have that opportunity and it felt like we need to do that while we can. Amen. And the opportunities there and uh, 50 years is significant. I think it it's, is. Somebody suddenly said that to us and there was a moment on a, on a Zoom actually call and I thought, oh my that's striking yeah. and it just it didn't leave me for the next hour i thought there's yeah. something that needs to be honored and Amen. wouldn't it be nice if we were in a succession process because we've been at where we are uh, in a succession pursuit yeah and then that fell into place so we it will be the potential if all was to go forward installation ending which i think so is great. an affirmation to the beginning Amen. because it's always you know, if you start something, you'd like to see that it has another and another. And Ken's yep. been very appreciative of me, but I see it as an arc all the way from that beginning to a new season, which is something that I think every church and John and I, you know, both found you you want to make sure you're looking for that arc and that oh, next season and and uh, and planning that for that. So I hope it's a I hope Ken can bless the future and the future can bless the start. That's May it be. What we hope for. Oh, that's so great. Well, great. at the very least, people can send nice videos and notes. People always like encouragement. I don't know anyone that's had enough encouragement. And uh, and I agree with you. Honor is important. So to be able to honor Ken and Joni rightly and some of the folks that made it so that we get to do what we get to do. Well, I'm, I'm really grateful for both of you guys, the story that you inhabit, that I get to take all this stuff for granted because you guys did a lot of really hard work so i'm really really grateful and i'm excited to tell more stories like this but also to celebrate uh together at our national conference and dream about what's next so thanks for making time guys thanks it was great The We Are Vineyard podcast is a production from the team at Vineyard USA. If you've been enjoying the podcast, here's a few ways you can help us. Leave us a review on the podcast platform of your choice. This helps more people find us. Connect with us online for additional resources. Our website is vineyardusa.org. And we're on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at at VineyardUSA. Thanks for listening. See you next week.